March 14th. Doesn't look much like spring out there today. Not by the looks of the snow. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Pete McCullough at his home here in Grovedale. We're talking the, the early years, and we got some exhibits on the table here to prove how early. Back to his first guide, guide license in 1939, and consecutive all the way up to 1986. So there has to be a lot of stories there, but uh, we were just talking about the... Uh, the well, go ahead, talk about the, that picture we were just looking at there, with shingling the... Uh, well, I think of the Pipestone Creek store. I think that was in 35. That's the one that's now down in the museum? Yes, that's the one that's in the museum now. And uh, the store before that, like, I don't know whether you want my... Sure, I want anything that my comes life to mind. story. That's no. exactly what we want, yeah. But I went to, when I was 11 years old, I went to uh, the Millerston School. And I stayed at a place, and it was about 80 rods from the school. It was handy. But in order to stay there, I'd have to go home at noon. Well, just before that, they handed me a milk pail at 6 o'clock in the morning. A guy 11 years old. And I had to milk two cows and feed them and get to school at 8 o'clock. Or 9 o'clock, I guess it was then. And I could make it in the morning, but at noon I had to come back and chop the water hole in the slough out, you know. And it was in the winter time. And uh, I'd have to open the water hole and feed the cows and the horses and make sure they all drank. And then they would stay out until 4 o'clock when I got out of school. I'd have to come home and clean the barns and feed the cattle and the horses. And it didn't work too good. <laughs> when I come home at noon, if I didn't get it all done, I caught hell. If I was late getting back to school, I caught hell. <laughs> <laughs> where was that school exactly? At Millerston. It's east of where the Pipestone Creek store was. Oh, so across the river here in Wembley. Yeah. So I just decided one day I would pack up my little bag and I headed for home. And where was home exactly? From there? It was down along the walk <clears throat> here. On the north side, on the Wembley side, or no, on this no, side? No, on the south side. Oh. You see, we was the first ones in here when we this settlement was opened up. Oh, yeah. Back in what year would that be? In the 30s, I imagine. 28. Going oh, 28. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got as far as Pipestone, and I was getting kind of cold, so I stopped in the store. No day K. Watts, I told him what happened and how I was getting along over there <coughs> at Millerson, so I didn't. He said, Go trapping. <laughs> I said, Hell, I haven't got no traps. He said, I'll give you a few. So he'd give me a few traps, and I didn't have a gun. So he, he sold me a. He charged it up. He charged me for the six traps and. A twenty-two and five boxes of shells. And squirrels was ten cents a piece, you know. I, I could make good money at that. <laughs> <laughs> you could only get a dollar a day if you was working out. So I got this this gun and these few traps and I come on home and I went down into the big seven that was east along the Wapiti, it, it burnt out, I think, in, in the 40s sometime. There was green timber there, and there was lots of deer. We practically lived off of the land, and at that time there was a, quite a bunch that went down there, and we all kind of camped together. 
uh, and uh, we put up a shelter, you know, and everything. We got we got along pretty good there. But anyway, I stayed two weeks, and I come out with forty squirrels. I took them over to AK, and I had money to spare. <laughs> <laughs> And since that, I've been a trapper. But the last three years, I can't trap. Not that I ain't able to. I still hold, hold the tra registered trap line, but the oil companies just went, come in, and the pipelines, and the loggers, and everything else, and they clean me right out. Last year I set my traps out and I lost 23. These guys come along and they see it, one of these old time traps, you know, and they say, that'll look good hanging on my wall. <laughs> well, it's gone. You're losing your traps to the tourists now. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's And that ain't, ain't the worst of it. The traps was nothing. I went to Dawson Creek and I bought a quad so I could get around, you know, in the spring of the year. And I decided I was going to set a beaver trap, so I left the quad sitting on top of the hill, you know. And I walked down with my trap and I was sitting there and there was a damn truck come along and they looked at this quad. They started her up and I never seen her any again. Hmm. I went to the police over it. They said, if you haven't got the number of the truck that took it, we can't do nothing. That's too bad. And the next next winter, I was over here on the Iroquois Creek, <coughs> and I'd left my toboggan sitting on the side of the road. I just bought it a couple of months before that. I hadn't got it, had it paid for her either, but I deal with Stojan in Sexsmith. Yeah. And it's not working? Yep, it is. <laughs> so, if I go there, you know, whether I got money or not, if I need something, you know, I knew his... <coughs> yeah, I don't know whether it's his dad or his brother, we got along real good together. And I dealt with him for years. Well, if I go in there, he, he just tells me to take it. <laughs> you know? Well, I guess that's and the way it used to be. Eh? Right was, back to how you got in the business in the first place. Yeah. So let's. So you were then you were home was just down here on this side of the Wapiti. Yeah. How did you and Henry get get into the? What, can you remember the first time you got into the high country? Well, the first time, about 1937, I went with Bert Osborne as a wrangler. He took a bunch of students from Wembley to Mount Robinson. Really? I think it was in 37. And I was on as a wrangler, and they took uh, these college students, they took took them through and then we came back a different way like we took them through the high country to go down and what a trip that was packed right out of Wembley packed right out of well or right, you, the, the district down yeah. There, yeah off the Wapen yeah we had to ford the river to start with <laughs> of course it was low then and all the way to Mount Robson. Yeah. And you talk about a wrangler trying to find a, a goddamn mountain sticking up in. in a bunch of other mountains. We'd have to climb at night to see where the hell it was, you know. None of us knew where where the hell we were going. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't see Mount Robson very often unless it's covered with clouds. And we got down there, and we got to the railroad on the other side, and we uh, 
we decided we was coming back and old Bertie went down to Jasper and he got about seven or eight more students to come back through with us. So we come back down through what's Grand Cache now. And I never rode down the prettier valley as the the Smoky Valley from well uh, what do they call about Hell's Gate now and that's up west of the road. The chutes there, yeah. And the chutes we come in somewhere's in there. And then we come over the the north side there. And we come down that valley and that was the most beautiful valley I had ever seen in the mountains. And we got back. And then in in thirty eight, I think it was, we got two hunters that wanted moose and we went up around uh, Sherman's up here. Was this with Osborne again? No, no. <coughs> it was Henry and I together. Oh. And you call it Sherman's. It's not Sherman's. Sherman Flats is on the north side of the river up on the hill there. That is the old Gunnerson Flats where they put the airstrip. And who were, who were Sherman and Gunnerson again? Well, Gunnerson was an old hermit that lived out there. And he lived where the strip is now? No, he lived at Two Lakes most of the time. But he used to, he had a cabin that, well, it's uh, about halfway up where the airstrip is now. Oh, I see. And he was a guy, you never walk behind him. And uh, we went into Two Lakes and he had a bunch of uh, hay, little piles out in the meadow. And old Adam Kenny and I, we was, he didn't like our horses, you know, they thought, he thought they might eat the dry hay while they was more for green stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Adam and I went over and helped him. We got two long poles and we'd about that far apart and we'd go and run them under them hay piles and then we'd take it to the next hay pile and we could load five of them little piles he had about a good fork full of what we'd use now and we'd pack them over beside where he had his little fence where he was stacking me. Is that on the first lake there? Yeah. Where on the east side of it or like where the cabins are now or? His cabin was right where the forestry cabin is. Right, right. And they dozed it out. And that was Gun Gunderson. That was G Gunderson. He had a lot of cabins around. He must have been in there quite a while. But anyway, after we got done piling this hay up, he walked up to us and we had them all piled there so he could just put them in the pile the way he wanted them, you know. He reached in his shirt pocket and he pulled out two twenty-dollar bills, and he gave one to Adam and one to me. <laughs> and they were three big buggers, <laughs> great big bills, you know. And he must have had them for a long time because I took them in, took mine in, old Bob Grands and Wembley, and he was just so happy to get that one. <laughs> <coughs> but we was only there about two hours, you know, and he paid good. <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, that was like a thousand dollars. God, yeah. Well, why didn't you, you say you, you didn't walk behind him or ahead of him or whatever you said he uh, Yeah, he always faced you. Uh, if you was going to go past him, you'd go past him on the front side. And a pistol. You never seen anybody that could handle one like him, <laughs> and he always had it on him. I wonder where he came from. I don't know. He just showed up in that country one day, I guess. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. he must have been one of the first down there. I think Pete Campbell trapped down there even earlier than that, though. I think. 
Do you ever hear of that? Did he have a cabin, a line cabin on the on two lakes there, way no. back when he was a kid? No, no. He camped this way. He Bridge Creek. Yeah, or Campbell Creek area. Campbell Creek, Bridge <coughs> Creek, or whatever the hell they call it. I thought he got down there in the early days trapping. So Gunderson would have been the first at two lakes then? Oh yeah, he was there for... Well, his cabin was an old cabin, but it was in good shape. He got them gooseberries to go out the top and half an inch across. He had gooseberries planted on the roof so they'd hold the moisture up there and wouldn't <laughs> drip through this dirt roof. And he had the benefit of the gooseberries. Yeah. <laughs> and he packed rhubarb roots in there and he had good rhubarb in there. But, uh, so that was the first trip for you and Henry was guide. Where did the hunters, they were the Americans or were they? Yeah. Yeah? How'd you connect with them? Uh, they came into Wembley and wanted somebody to take some hunting. Right. <coughs> so that was the start of your uh, guiding career. That was it. And then where did you go from there in that business? Well, then we, in 39, we went up in the Monkman Pass into B.C. We was packing tourists into Canusha Falls. Trail rides, like? Well, trail rides and looking around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but last summer, Richard, he flew from... Uh, That's Richard Brooks. Richard Brooks. He flew from Junction Mountain here, the eastern slope of the Rockies, and he filmed it all the way to Brooks Falls in the, in the Mountain Pass. Hmm. And... Uh, He had, uh, well, his dad was down there one time. We went fishing below a falls. It wasn't this is, this is Carl Brooks. We're talking. Carl Brooks. Yeah. And he was standing on a flat rock. And he said, there's got to be fish in here. Richard, he took about 23 there, and I don't think that he was 15 minutes at it. And old Carl, he stamped his... You know, to jump to see if they come out from under the rock, the damn rock broke off. And there was, well, it's fairly deep water, but he, he caught himself before he got in the water, and after that we called that Brooks Falls. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got all these years and years, 39 to 86, and and with your Class A guide license, what uh, the mainstay of that? Where you and Henry, where was kind of your your base of operation over the years with the hunting and so on? Where did that? Around the Kakwa Valley, the high country, then, the or, high country. Yeah. yeah. So what did you guide? Well, I guess everything, eh? Moose everything. And, yeah, everything that was up there. We've got a share of them. Can you think of any memorable hunts when you were getting going there? Memorable hunters or... Uh, well, there were so many of them you can't pick out one. Yeah. I go out there for a good time and I try to make the hunter have a good time too. <laughs> Sometimes we blunder but then we can laugh about it, you know. What was a good class blunder to you? Get him right up within 50 yards of an animal and he misses it. <laughs> <laughs> but that don't matter to me. As long as he gets a shot at him, I, that's it. Up to his doings. That's Where was your favorite country back there to hunt? Actually, about the, the best place was Horn Ridge around uh, the north side there up into, well, we called it Lonesome Valley now. The caribou used to be in there quite a bit. And then we used to go up east of Greenwater Lake, Cecilia Lake, or whatever the hell they want to call it now. Yeah, you <laughs> called it Greenwater Lake? <laughs> yeah. The east side there, that was right up. Down Just there. let me interrupt here, because I, I noted from what we are listening to earlier there that 
Tell tell me how uh, Dead Horse Meadows got its name. Well, it was Mouse Cash Creek, and it was that way for quite a few years. And then Mrs. Sid Sunderman, she made bread there one time. And it was at the time when they had to use that slow yeast, you know, set mm -hmm. it overnight. Mm -hmm. And she made her bread, and that's where she cooked it. On an open fire, and she made bread. And how the hell she done it, I don't know. But according to to her after you got to know her if she could do anything like that. <laughs> so then it was called bread camp. So then it was bread camps. And then, <clears throat> I don't know just what year it was, but anyway, uh, we went in there, we had four hunters from Texas on that trip. And the one horse got that little scratch on his back. It wasn't bad, and it was right up on his hip. And it was right that close to the end of the, the hunt light. So we had to come out, and we had two more to go back. And when we went back with the second trip, it, uh, it was in bad shape. I didn't even look twice. I couldn't see an animal suffer like that. <laughs> so, so then it was Dead Horse Meadows. Then it was Dead Horse Meadows. And what did you call Torrens Mountain? Bitch Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you you tried to claim that bugger with a horse. <laughs> it got its name good. <laughs> Now they call it Torrance Mountain. <laughs> it was something everybody agreed on then. Oh yeah, everybody knew when you talked about that one. All the guides, you know, tried to. And it's so damn steep. And we'd get up there. A lot of times we'd sleep up there, you know, overnight. Let the animals come out and feed late, you know, mm -hmm. out of the bush and you know, where you could spot them. One morning, I, one night I stayed up there and I woke up in the morning, you know, two big rams, not 200 feet from where we were sleeping. The rocks come out like this and we just made our bed right in under the out of the rock, you know, so the sun come out in the morning and shone right in on us. We was nice and warm in there. <laughs> Not them big rams right there. And try to get a hunter awake with keeping him quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it? Yeah, we got one of them. But... There are so many things to talk about, but I don't know, I, Richard and I have been trying to get them on tape and one thing and another. Well, it was a different world, a different lifestyle. Yeah, you never locked your door. Oh. If I was going past your house and I needed a cup of tea or something, I always stopped and made it. And nobody thought anything about it. <laughs> Just leave some kindling in the wood box when you leave? Yeah. We have a, another trap line at Two Lakes, well, my son's. And we tried locking that up, but that didn't work. We had to put another door on already and locks they, <laughs> they was tore off like it was going out of style <laughs> so we just leave it open now well <clears throat> when did you, you you kept trapping all along then you'd guide in in the um in the fall uh 
in 40, 46, I think it was, I got married and my wife and I, we threw our outfits together. She had some horses and I had horses and we threw them together. That's more or less when we went on our own like Henry was on his own and I was on my own. <coughs> but here, just let me check this I have to get my end on the first side. Shut it down for a while so I can get another coffee. Alright, I'll do that. <laughs> In fact, uh, you mentioned a couple of names about some of the other people that were back there in the early days, like Adam Kenny. Old Adam Kenny, Ed Stoney, Dan St. Arnold. I can thank my guidance to old Dan St. Arnold. Is that right? Because I was young and he kind of took me under his wing and <laughs> told me where to go, you know. I didn't know the country at that time. But I, I, where where was he? That he, was he used to live down here, the other side of where the dump is now. Mm -hmm. That's where he lived. Where did those Indians come from, like Adam and people like that? They were they were they originals here? They some say they come out of the park, and some say they were, they were the Iroquois down there at the creek. And where where did they come <laughs> from originally? There was two. Shepherd or two uh, Kenny women buried on Nose Creek. It's what we used to call the graveyards. I went back in there and it's all washed out now. Where was that? Next, right across from the settlement there? Or? No, no. My wife's grandfather is right in the middle of the road going onto the bridge at Nose Creek. Is that right? They just pushed right over his grave. I know because I was working for old M. B. McMillan at the time, and I was had a an old T. D. eighteen with a bucket on behind, an old cable bucket. <laughs> yeah, my dad wrote cat and carried all the cable buckets. Yeah, but so the, were they grave sites or were they spirit houses, like in the trees? It was or? a grave site. And they just put the road right over top of it? Right over top of them. They missed the other ones. They're just on the east side of the road. And there's two more back on the side hill again. That's back, what is it, upstream now? Downstream. Not downstream. So to the left if you're going south across the bridge. To the right. Oh, to the right. Oh, the flats there. Yeah. 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 There's one right out in the middle of that big open flat there. There's a grave there somewhere, but I could never find it. Years ago, I knew about where it was. Mm -hmm. You could see, you know, but... So your wife was from that country, obviously, then. Her, her dad was down at the creek there? Mm -hmm. Where did, where did the, her people come from originally? Well, that varies. Some people says Sturgeon Lake, some people says up north and my name's Flair and they still own half of that town. And people bought it out, but they bought it from their own guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened a lot. Yeah. And what about Adam? Where did he I guess he traveled the mountains quite a bit, eh? Yeah. It was back with the keeping uh, even, eh? He used to worked for the railroad when he was young, down around uh, McBride and Kamloops, down in there. He talked about that a lot. But his dad, where Gunnerson Creek comes in to Nose Creek, his old cabin is right there. Adam Kenny's dad? Yeah. Is that right? And then he went blind, and they moved out to the Wapiti here. That would be going back some years. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I met Adam on different occasions. He was, he was quite a, quite a man. I guess he was. He had a lot of respect among Indian people as a oh, kind yeah. of a medicine man, or yeah.
Yeah, he he respected the other people. I'm getting too far away here. Yeah, you don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> people will think you're tiring out. But uh, so did the like no scrape. They call that Cheddar Flats. That is not Cheddar Flats. Cheddar Flats is on Pickle Creek. It's up from the bridge about eight or ten miles where old Pete Cheddar used to live. That's what where Cheddar Flats is. <laughs> When did that Nose Creek settlement get started then? Well, it started out, there wasn't too many there. They, you know, they'd camp there and then they'd go back. Right, different seasons. Yeah, it was a great camping ground there. Uh, Paul Winnie Andy, he was my father-in-law. He was my wife's dad. He, uh, how the hell am I going to tell this? <laughs> uh, his dad was at Nose Creek, and uh, somehow he sold, he had cattle, and he sold his cattle to old Wapiti Brown. An old Wapiti Brown come in here across the fiddle. There's big meadows in there. And that's where he kept them. It's kind of hard to believe, but... What years would those be? Those be? Oh, it'd be before my time. Like, more before I came into this area. So into the 20s and back to the... Yeah. But... Uh, I knew old Wapiti Brown, he used to pack in the mountains quite a bit too. And we all knew each other, you know, Kelly mm -hmm. Sunderman, Sid Sunderman, Bert Dalglish, all them guys. And uh, they told me that he sold his cows for $4.75 apiece. <laughs> Good thing prices have gone up. Yeah. But then old Wapiti Brown, he kept them out here, and as far as I could figure out, he never sold anything. And he had a hell of a herd of cattle out there. And what was his story? Where did he come from or go to? Or? I don't think I've ever heard of Wapiti Brown. Well, that's what we called him. I knew him, but he was pretty well, you know, he was up in years and pretty well out of it. Outfitting and stuff. So, <clears throat> speaking of the outfitting again, we were saying, or you were saying rather, that uh, in about the mid 40s, you and your uh, wife then sort of threw together and started guiding on your own. Then. Yeah. And was that just strictly hunting in the fall, or was it? Yeah. Yeah. And in packing rocks with the geologists of the mountains. Helicopters run us guys out of business. Is that right? <laughs> oh yeah, we made big money on that. And like we'd go out with a bunch of horses and we would go to a certain mountain and they'd chip, you know, get samples, fossils. Yeah. And uh, that's what they would send back to Calgary, you know, to get analyzed. Yeah. And we packed them hell. Sometimes I had as high as 30 head of pack horses just packing rocks. Oh, <laughs> boy. <laughs> That's a serious pack string business. And the way we'd work, like there'd be more than one of us out there. Like there'd be uh, Cameron, Johnny Cameron and I, we'd work pretty close together. He was from Oberly Lake. And, uh, Bert Dalglish and Bo Kelly Sunderman. We'd pack in the summertime, you see, out there before hunting season come. And 
a couple of us would take these rocks and we'd bring them out. Well, that trip, we'd do it. The next trip, a couple of the other guys would do it, you see? So, we always knew where everybody else was. And no radios at that time. You, you just knew where they was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and you packed uh, those rocks right out to here? Where, where was the closest place where you could offload them? Wembley. <laughs> and rode them on a freight car and ship them out. How long would it take you to come back, say, from the Torrens area back to Wembley with a pack? Uh, from Sherman's, we generally take about five days. Five days from Sherman Meadows to Wembley? Yeah. But when we was loaded, we'd never work a horse over eight hours. If he had to saddle on for eight hours, it, it came off, regardless of where we was. And that kept our horses' backs good. Then. Well, how many horses did you have back in those years? My wife, she ordered three cattle liners in 85, we shipped out 113 head of horses. Is that right? And that's when we finished it, in the 85. Yeah. But I went back with 100 in 86. And what kind of horses were they? Kind of big uh, grade horses? Or? About 1,200 pounds. Um, Better, smaller horses and stocking. Yeah, more than horses. A lot of these horses they take up there now, well, we wouldn't even look at them <laughs> twice. <laughs> You're not a big Arabian fan for packing in the mountains? Well, they got so goddamn spindly little legs on them that the way I, I talk on this thing, I, I talk my language. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> I should watch my language a little bit, but <laughs> speaking of geology back there, was there any any rumors of gold back in that country? I know where there's a seam of quartz back there. Yeah, I know where there's quartz. There's gold. Yeah, usually. I was going to walk up there again. It's down here on the top of the mountain. And you watch on TV these gold trails and ghost towns in southern D.C. It's been getting me thinking. <laughs> well, did you ever do any panning? Did you ever see any colors in the creeks below or anything? Oh, yeah. There's gold in Wapiti. But probably not what you could make wages. No. But there is some place uh, Peggy Giro married a guy from southern B.C. And he used to go up the Wapiti in the boat, in his rowboat, you know, take his grub up and he'd stay up there two or three months. And he made good wages. That was back in the 30s. And she was uh, my first cousin. Really? So... He used to tell us a lot, but he'd never tell us which creeks he was in. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you that much. <laughs> but there is gold in the Wapiti right here at the ferry. You can pan, you can get it. Color. It's mm -hmm. quite gold. Yeah. What about other points of interest, like major fossils or... Uh, are there other burial sites out there that are uh, important? Or? There is a lot of them. And uh, there's a woman from uh, Mobley Lake. She wants me to go with her. She works with that pipeline that's going through by two lakes. Mm -hmm. And she said that not to do anything in, in June and July because she wanted to work with me. Want right, to go back there and find him? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They pay good, too. That's good. They, uh, 
they wanted to know where the buffalo head camps was. Well, <laughs> I took them out there last fall and told them where it was. Yeah. Buffalo head camps, what was that? That's beside the hot springs out there. <laughs> <laughs> now I got you going. Yeah. There's hot springs in two lakes. Is that right? Yeah. It ain't real hot or anything, but it don't freeze all winter. Not like stinking springs, it's it's sulfur, but it's cold on the, on the trail there to the falls. Well, there's a lot of ice gets on them too. But uh, it's where Gunderson Creek, you cross it right at the bottom of the hill. When you're coming to the first lake? When you're going down to the first lake. Yeah. It runs underground. Yeah. And it comes out down in that swamp down there. And they wanted, to, that's where the, like in the early days, I seen a lot of buffalo skulls there what the Indians had eat on, mm -hmm. and uh, we always called it Buffalo Head Camps. Well, she wanted to know where that was because history, she's a native woman, and her ancestors had told her about this. Right. The buffalo used to come down there to drink in the wintertime. Right. And they had that big camp set up there, and... Uh, Old Adam Kenny, he told me about they used to go up to them where the creek comes back out to hunt buffalo. His dad had told him that. <laughs> right. I knew his dad too. I packed him a good many porcupines down so he could eat a porcupine. <laughs> Your favorite of him? Oh yeah. <coughs> Actually, a porcupine is good. I read it. I haven't, but they say it's just like pork almost. Good there. It is a little different. And you burn the quills off them and then you skin them right. That would make it easier. And that burn of them quills sets a flavor into the meat. Oh, is that right? And I like it, really. So you gut them first, or you, or you just... No, you cook them, you burn them just when you kill them. In the early days, old Sam Wilson, he used to go around the muskegs quite a bit, and these trees that's hanging with uh, moss hanging on them, mm -hmm. he'd set them on fire. And the porcupine would be up the tree. And by the time he fell out of the tree, he was pretty well scorched off. You could put him in a sack and pack him. The <laughs> 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 goddamn fire, you know, would just go up the tree. It's a, a moss. <coughs> that hangs on the trees. You've seen it. Yeah, yeah, some call it witch's hair or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. I guess that's caribou food, eh? That is the best eye medicine you can get. Is that right? What, do you make a tea out of it for eye medicine? You just boil it and then put patches on it. You can rag and put it on your eyes. Hmm. There's a lot of medicines out there, isn't there? And I know a lot of them. I bet you would. As old Paul, yes, he was a medicine man. Paul Winyandy. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And old Adam Kinney was, too. He told me a lot. Did Adam learn it from his dad, or how did Adam... Did he just find he had a gift that way, or...? I don't know. There is a lot of them now, say, they're medicine men, but they ain't nothing like the old timers. No. No, Adam had that special respect among people. Yeah. Who know. What about the caribou? What, uh, 
when you say you've seen herds out there in the early days, what kind of numbers, what do you think there was for caribou back there if you had a roundup in the whole South Wapiti? Holy Christ. Where would a person put them? <laughs> there was that it many? was nothing to see a herd of a hundred. And then helicopters come in. And they see a herd of caribou, they hover down over top of them. The same with the goats. Hover down close to them. They all come down into the timber. Right. And the timber wolves got them. Now you'll be down outside of... Uh, on our trap line out there, they, there is uh, a herd. I don't know how many there is there. You can see six, seven at a time, you know. And they was getting so we could drive past them with the toboggans and they wouldn't run. But now they're logging it all out. Yeah. They might just as well go and kill them off because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. They got nothing left. The same as my trap line. I have nothing left. Where exactly is your trap line? The uh, south, south one? Right here. Oh, I mean, but I thought you said down south. There was another one. We've got one, one of two lakes. But this this trap line here, I can't set a trap on it. Overnight it's gone. I think when we was talking before, when I lost that quad, somebody stole it. They, we got carried away, and I had my toboggan out there, and the guy jumped on it, and away he went with it. I never seen it again. It was one that I just, I just paid thirty three hundred dollars for. <laughs> Why? That's sad. Like you say, it used to be a country where everybody was taking care of each other. Well, yeah, but. I got 76 oil wells on my trap line. And I don't know the, the logging companies, every place where I used to have a line set, they've logged it out around Bald Hill down here. Yeah. What were some of the best years in trapping? Prices and so on. Lena and I, we wanted to go to Edmonton. We wanted to go into the Army Navy store in Edmonton. Because they have some pretty good buys and, you know, some stuff that we could use. And we said we would trap mink for a month and then we would go. And we took 168 mink pelts to Edmonton. We have $18 a piece for them. <laughs> wow. And then prices went up. They went up to seven, eight hundred dollars But at that time there was activity on our trap line, so we chased them all out. And they're mostly north now. North of the Peace River and east. Well, the beaver seem to be coming back. I don't know why. At least down on the bottom line here. I guess there hasn't been a market for them or something. I made the most out of beaver that I have for quite a few years. The prices are down there nothing. Is that right? I sold six beaver and I got $65 for it last spring. I only took, and the other five, I, I only took 11 beavers last spring. And that's all I'm going to take this spring. There's just one colony that's close to the road that is going to, going to uh, cause trouble. You know, they might flood the road out. I'll take 11 out of there and that'll kind of slow them down. Mm -hmm. 
but there is no use. I more or less farm my beaver. I don't kill them. When I got this trap line, there was two beaver colonies on it. And the other guys would get permits, you know, to get five or six beavers. I didn't. I let them multiply. <laughs> And I've been at it since 1946. <laughs> On the whole, you'd say a pretty good way to live. Well, the way I look at it, if you go and kill them off, you ain't going to have any. <laughs> There's a certain amount of logic in that. Yeah, but you... You go to a beaver dam, you take one or two, you know. You take, if you take the one, you might as well take the other one too, the male and the female. But if you take, say, two out of the beaver dam, but don't take the big one, you'll see the, the old guy that will come out. You'll be the, the dominator of that colony. You will always leave him, <laughs> unless you, he gets in a corner bar, then you can't help it. He's got the blueprints, eh? Yeah, he, he's the engineer of the outfit. <laughs> well, can you think of anything I haven't asked you that sticks out about that country or the people? Or Well, there ain't much. There is a lot of things to talk about, but with me, I can't. Unless I get started on something, I don't know when to quit. <laughs> but if you move this over to the TV, that interview that that Richard and I had, there's a lot of good stories on that coming up. Or just uh, just on the tail end there, the second side. Just a sec. Let's see it. Let's stop it.